This is Concept E Classes and today we will deal with Chapter 7 of Class 9 Science, Diversity in Living Organisms. Now this is a very big chapter so we will be covering this chapter in two parts. So let's see what we are going to study in part 1. So first we will see the basis of classification, then we will see how the evolution and classification are connected with each other, then we will see how these organisms are classified. They are classified into different groups which we call as kingdoms. We will study about all kingdoms except for Animalia which we will study in the next part along with nomenclature. So let's start. Now there are a variety of life forms in our earth. We call this as biodiversity. We have already explained about biodiversity in class 8. If you want to know more about this, please refer that video. I will try to tag that video as well. So in simple words, we can say biodiversity means the diversity or the variety of life forms present on the earth. Now these life forms may include different plants, animals and even microorganisms and they all work together in an ecosystem. Now these organisms or living organisms are very different from each other, right? Take the case of a simple microscopic bacteria. It has a size of about a few micrometer to a blue whale which is about 30 meters in size to the redwood trees which is even 100 meters. Similarly, the pine trees, they live for about thousands of years while insects like mosquito, they die within a few days. The life also ranges from a colorless worm to very brightly colored butterflies and flowers. So the, there is a variety of life around us and this biological diversity it is constantly changing as well and this variety of life around us has actually evolved on the earth over a millions of years. We will study more about this evolution in the following slides so at that time we will understand more about this. Now it is very hard to understand about all these living organisms right because the earth itself there are about 8.7 million species of living organisms and the biologists they try to look for similarities among these organisms so that they could classify or put them in different groups or classes and till now I think they have identified about uh, 1.2 to 2 million species of organisms in this earth. So this branch of biology which identifies names and classifies different organisms present on the earth is called as taxonomy. Taxonomy is a branch of science concerned with the classification, identification and naming of different organisms present on earth and Carlos Linnaeus is known as the father of modern taxonomy. So we saw that the biologist they in order to understand organisms they started to look for similarities and they started to put them in groups or they started to classify them. Now what is the basis of classification? Let's see. Now many attempts were made at classifying living things into different groups and one such classification was done by a Greek thinker named Aristotle. He classified animals according to where they lived on land, in water or in Air. That is Aristotle, he classified living organisms on the basis of their habitat, whether they lived on air, land or water. But this classification was very simple and misleading too. Why? Because the animals that live in sea, take the case of a whale or a stingray or a seahorse, even a fish, they all have different characteristics, right? They are very different from each other. The only thing that is same is that their habitat, that is they all live in water and there are even animals that live both in land and water so this classification was not that good therefore it was decided by the biologist to classify the living organisms on the basis of hierarchy see this is a hierarchy now this hierarchical classification was based on the similarities and dissimilarities in the characteristics of living organism now what do you mean by characteristic a characteristic is a particular feature or a particular function like movement, appearance, breathing, respiration, excretion, growth, reproduction, etc. Say for example, uh, the five fingers in a hand, right? This is a characteristic. Similarly, bunion tree, can it move? No, that is a characteristic of a bunion tree. So the hierarchical classification was based on the similarities of these characteristics and organisms having similar characteristics were placed in 
one category so like that they started to classify organisms now in this hierarchy of classification the characteristics of the lowest most level they decide the broadest division among the living organisms they are independent of any other characteristics that come under them say for example here the classification of animals now this is a lowermost level and this classification of animal is the broadest division among this divisions okay now this classification of animals they are independent of any other characteristics that a turtle show or a frog show okay but the characteristics in the next level that is here the vertebrates they come under the classification of animals right they are dependent on each other now based on the vertebrates they come warm blooded and cold blooded or based on the invertebrates it consists of with joint legs and without joint legs then further classification like that so the characteristics in the next level would be dependent on the previous level and they would decide the variety in the next level so in this way we can build a whole hierarchy of mutually related characteristics to be used for classification but nowadays the biologists have started to look at many interrelated characteristics starting from the nature of the cell in order to classify all living organisms so let's understand some of the examples of such characteristics which are used for hierarchical classification now when we take the nature of the cell the first thing that comes to our mind is nucleus right so there are two types of cells eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells eukaryotic cells we have already studied they have a well defined nucleus they have membrane bound organelles whereas in the case of prokaryotic cells they do not have a well defined nucleus they do not have membrane bound organelles these cells they can either have a cell wall sometimes they do not therefore we can say nucleus can be a basic characteristic of classification now do these cells occur singly or are they grouped together or do they live as an indivisible group the cells when they group together they form a single organism which is a multicellular organisms that time they use the principle of division of labor whereas a unicellular organism they carry out all the functions by themselves okay so this can also be a characteristic for classification now some organisms they produce their own food what do we call such organisms as autotrophs whereas some have to depend on other organisms for food they are called as heterotrophs so this can also be a characteristic for classification now if you take uh, plants as well as animals we can see that these organisms they develop parts they like that as tissues and organs and organ system so this is also a characteristics which are used for classification so have you understood the basis of classification so in summary we can say that the major characteristics considered for classifying all organisms are the presence of nucleus whether they are eukaryotes prokaryotes number of cell unicellular multicellular whether they have cell walls or not the mode of nutrition whether they are autotrophic or heterotrophic the level of organization how much their body have developed have they developed into tissues or organs or organ system so the biologist they used this as a basis for classification of living organisms now we understood the basis of classification now why do we need a classification now if we classify organisms into several groups it is easier for us to study it also helps us in understanding all the life forms in just one glance that is when we see the classification chart we can understand easily how, what all are the life forms present in the earth how did they evolve we can understand how they are in, related to each other we can also understand why these organisms are found at certain parts of the region whereas some organisms they do not live in certain regions this classification actually forms the basis of development of other biological science so that is why we need a classification now let's say about evolution and how classification and evolution are connected to each other now what is classification we already studied the arrangement of organisms based on particular characteristics is called as classification now some characteristics might make changes in the body design than others with respect to time see this is the lamarck theory it says that after a long period of time the giraffe's length neck has been lengthened see so once a certain body design comes into existence it will shape the effects of all other following design changes as it already exists this means that the classification of life forms 
will be closely related to this evolution. What is evolution? Let's see. Over a period of time, the living organisms, they started to accumulate changes either in their body type or size or their features. And these changes, they allow them to survive better with the change of environment. We saw right in the case of a giraffe or an elephant, how certain changes occurred in the body. And these changes actually allow these organisms to live better with the change in environment. This is called as evolution. And Charles Darwin first found about this and he described this idea of evolution in 1859 in his book, The Origin of Species. If you want to know how Charles Darwin found out this idea or more about this book, please message me in the comment section. I'll give you a separate video on this. So I hope you understood what is classification and what is evolution. Now, if we connect this idea of evolution to classification, we can group these organisms into two, primitive organisms and advanced organisms. Now, the group of organisms which have an ancient body design and which have not changed very much with respect to time are called as primitive organisms and they are also called as lower organisms. That is, these group of organisms, they have not changed much with respect to time. They have the same body design. Examples are the sponges, molluscus, cylindrates. These all are primitive organisms. Now, in the case of advanced organisms, these are the organisms which have acquired particular body changes with respect to time. Okay, These organisms are called as advanced organisms or high organisms like human beings, cats, dogs, elephants. All these are advanced organisms. Now, let's see about the hierarchy of classifications. Now, biologists such as Ernest Haeckel, Robert Whittaker, Carl Woese, they have tried to classify all living organisms into broad categories called as kingdoms. And after these kingdoms, they further classified this by naming the subgroups at various levels as given below. First, we have the kingdom, then phylum for animals, division for plants, class, order, family, genus and species. Thus, by separating organisms on the basis of hierarchy of characteristics into smaller and smaller groups, we arrive at the basic unit of classification which is called as species. Thus, the basic unit of classification is species. Broadly, we can say that a species includes all organisms that are similar enough to breed and to continue on. Okay. So, in this chapter, we will be studying the classification done by Whittaker. The classification proposed by Whittaker have five kingdoms, Monera, Protista, Fungi, Plantae and Animalia. And all this classification is based on the characteristics that we mentioned in the previous slide. What all were they? On the basis of the cell structure, the mode of nutrition, the body organization, and the presence of cell wall or not, etc. Then, Vos, Carl Vos, he modified this by introducing a new division in Monera into Archaeobacteria and Eubacteria, okay, which is also in use now. Now, let's understand more about the classification done by Whittaker. So, what all were the kingdoms proposed by Whittaker? The first one was the kingdom of Monera, Protista, Fungi, Plantae and Animalia. So, all this classification is based on the presence of nucleus, the number of cells, if they have a cell wall or not, the mode of nutrition, like if they are autotrophs or heterotrophs, and the level of organization. So, let's understand more about these kingdoms based on these characteristics. Okay. So, the first kingdom that we're going to study is the kingdom Monera. So, let's understand about the organisms that come under the kingdom of Monera. Do these organisms have a nucleus? No, they do not have a well-defined nucleus or membrane-bound organelles. Number of cells? Single. They are unicellular organisms. They are not multicellular. And they show diversity based on many other characteristics. For example, some of these cells have cell walls, while some do not. So based on this, there will be a changes in the body design as well. What is the mode of nutrition? These organisms can either be autotropic or heterotropic. What was autotropic and heterotropic nutrition? Autotrophs are those organisms that make their own food by the process of photosynthesis, for example, plants, algae, etc. And heterotrophs are those organisms that get food from the environment 
or they depend on other organisms okay so the mode of nutrition in the organisms coming under monera are either autotrophic or heterotrophic and they do not show any multicellular body designs so this group examples include the bacteria blue green algae uh, cyanobacteria and mycoplasma and uh, karl woos as we said earlier he further subdivided this kingdom monera into archaeobacteria and eubacteria so if you want to know more about this message me in the comment section i'll give you a separate video on this okay now let's understand the organisms that come under the kingdom protista now do these organisms have a well defined nucleus yes they have a well defined nucleus and membrane bound organelles that is why they called as eukaryotic organisms and are they single cellular or multicellular they are unicellular and the level of organization we can say that for locomotion or for the movement these organisms they use appendages like this or hair like cilia or a whip like flagella okay the mode of nutrition can be either autotrophic or heterotrophic examples are unicellular algae diatoms and protozoans so third kingdom that we are going to study is the kingdom of fungi so let's understand more about the organisms that come under this kingdom now these are eukaryotic organisms that is they have a well defined nucleus and membrane bound organelles their mode of nutrition is heterotrophic some of them are saprotrophs as well saprotrophs are those organisms that feed on dead or decaying organic matter others are parasites as they require a living protoplasm of a host for food what are parasites parasites in an organism that live in or on an organism of another species we call that as host and the parasites they benefit by deriving nutrients from the host best example is the mosquito okay you have already studied about saprotrophs and parasites and symbionts in your class 7 right so these fungi can either be saprotrophs or sometimes they can be parasites and the level of organization is that many are capable to become multicellular organisms at certain stages in their life do they have a cell wall yes they have a cell wall made of a tough complex sugar called as chitin so this is red red this is called as chitin some examples of fungi are yeast mold mushrooms etc now some fungal species they uh, live in a permanent or a mutual dependent relationship with certain blue green algae or cyanobacteria now such relationships are called as symbiosis or symbiotic relationship it is a close ecological relationship between the individuals here they both share the same shelter and nutrition and uh, here the fungal species that have a symbiotic relationship with the blue green algae are the lichens okay then the next kingdom is plantae let's see about the organisms that come under this kingdom they are eukaryotes that is they have a well defined nucleus and membrane bound organelles number of cells they are multicellular do they have cell walls yes they have cell walls mode of nutrition they are autotrophs and they use chlorophyll for photosynthesis thus all plants are included in this group now this plantae kingdom is further classified so what on basis are they classified the first level of classification among this plants are based on differentiated or distinct parts that is if they have a stem or a leaf like that the next level of classification is based whether uh, they have a differentiated plant body uh, or they have certain tissues for the transport of water and other substances further classification it uh, looks at the ability to bear seeds if that plant have seeds and whether that seeds are enclosed within fruits so based on these characteristics the kingdom of plantae is further classified now let's see how the plantae are again subdivided first one is thallophyta bryophyta pteridophyta angiosperms and gymnosperms so let's see more about these subgroups so the first subgroup of plant is thallophyta the plants that do not have a well differentiated body design it falls under this group these are actually primitive organisms the body is not differentiated into roots or stems or leaves and they occur in the form of thallus the plant in this group are commonly called as algae these plants are aquatic in nature 
the mode of nutrition is obviously autotrophic some examples are spirogaia eulothrix cladophora alva and chara now the next group is bryophyta now these are called as the amphibians of the plant kingdom the plant does not have a root stems leaves or roots they have no specialized tissue for the conduction of water and other substance from one part of the body to another examples are moss funaria and marchantia the group is pteridophyta in this group the plant body is differentiated into roots stems and leaves do they have specialized tissues for the conduction of water yes they have specialized tissue for the conduction of water and other substances from one part of the body to another some examples are marsilia ferns and hostel have you noticed i have not mentioned about the reproductive parts of plants in all these three groups why because the reproductive organs of the plants in thallophyta bryophyta and pteridophyta are very unnoticeable and that is why they are called as cryptogams or those with hidden reproductive organs whereas what are phanerogams then they are the plants with well differentiated reproductive parts that ultimately make seeds seeds are the result of sexual reproduction so they consist of an embryo along with the food uh, which is stored inside it which assists the initial growth of the embryo during germination whereas in the case of thallophytes bryophytes and pteridophytes they have naked embryos called as spores this phanerogams is further divided into angiosperms and gymnosperms so let's see about gymnosperms this term is derived from the two greek words gymno meaning naked and sperma meaning seed the plant of this group bear naked seeds and are not enclosed in fruits you might have seen such pine uh, seeds right they are not enclosed in fruits they are as they are like that itself so they are usually perennial that is they sustain for a long time they are evergreen and woody examples are pine and deodar the next subgroup is angiosperms now this word is also made from two greek words angio meaning covered and sperma meaning seed these are also called as flowering plants the seeds that develop inside an ovary which is modified to become a fruit okay now the plant embryos in the seeds they have structures called as cotyledons so this is a cotyledon see the cotyledons are also called as seed leaves because in many instances they emerge and become green when the seed germinates the angiosperms are divided into two groups on the basis of the number of cotyledons if the plant have the plant with the seed have a single cotyledon they are called as monocots and if the plants with seeds have two cotyledons they are called as dicots this is the example see for monocots jowar maize wheat coconut and for dicots pea gram groundnut sunflower water lily etc so these are the differences between monocots and dicots if you want to know more about this message me in the comment section i'll take a separate video on this next kingdom proposed by whitaker would be discussed in part 2 which is the kingdom animalia and about nomenclature as well till then stay tuned may god bless you all thank you so much stay safe and take care bye bye